Folks, I want you to open your Bible to the Gospel of St. Luke. This is part two of a message I began last week. And it's called, When God Shuts the Door. Now, beloved, I have to tell you, I really don't enjoy preaching on things like this. I, um, it's necessary because you have to preach all the counsel of God. But it's so apropos for the time and redemptive history that we're in right now. Because most of you don't know where we have fallen from. When I say we, Christendom, and especially in the last 25 years, but even before that, where we have come so far apart, so many nominal Christians who know very little about the Word of God, and yet they're trusting in their feelings, they're trusting in uh, whatever they're trusting, but yet that has nothing to do with redemption, does it? So let's all stand up, please, for the reading of God's Word. This is part two, when God shuts the door. When God shuts the door. Luke chapter 13, beginning with verse 22. The Bible says, And he went through the cities and villages, teaching and journeying toward Jerusalem. Now, Jesus knew when he went to Jerusalem he was going to be crucified. But nevertheless, he had to fulfill the Scriptures, and he had to preach the Scriptures. Amen? He said one unto him, Lord, are there few that be saved? Now, remember, he'd been talking about how hard it is to get into the kingdom. And he said unto them, Strive to enter in at the straight gate. For many, I say unto you, will seek to enter in and shall not be able. When once the master of the house has risen up and had shut to the door, and ye begin to stand without or outside, and to knock at the door, saying, Lord, Lord, open unto us. And he shall answer and say unto you, I know you not whence ye are. Then shall ye begin to say, We have eaten and drunk in thy presence, and thou hast taught in our streets. But he shall say, I tell you, I know you not whence ye are. Depart from me, all ye workers of iniquity. Workers of iniquity means to sin against the moral and spiritual light of truth that you know. Workers of iniquity. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth when you shall see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God and you yourselves thrust out. Of course, uh, in the narrative here, Jesus is speaking to a lot of the Jews that were following him as a Messiah. But he says, listen, unless you follow me to the end, you'll be cast out of the kingdom. And the same goes for us. Amen. These things are written for our example, upon whom the ends of the world have come, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 10. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the infallible Word of God. Lord, we're considering a most serious and sober subject. And Father, you know, you know, O oh God, that unless you laid this on my heart, I wouldn't have preached it. But Father, I pray I'd do it just, preach it with the right spirit. And Lord, open up the eyes of our understanding. Enlighten our hearts, O oh God. Open our minds. Indelibly stamp thy truth of your word, will, and ways in our hearts. Be with this preacher, Father. Give me physical strength and give me a spiritual anointing, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. And you may be seated. Last week we saw that upon hearing how hard and restrictive entrance into the kingdom of God was, there's a fellow in the crowd who hollered out, Lord, <laughs> then are there few that be saved? In other words, you're making it almost impossible for us to get into the kingdom. In fact, Matthew's parallel gospel says with, uh, all things are impossible with men, but they are possible with God. Amen. We are totally dependent on God for our salvation. But anyways, beloved, he asked the most profound question, and I told you it was a question that every professing Christian and disciple of Christ really needs to ask in their life. We don't want to be like sheep dumb before their shearers led to the slaughter. The Bible says we're to give an answer for the hope that's in us with meekness and fear. Come now, come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord. Would you say amen? So they, they wanted to know, beloved, are there few that are going to get into the kingdom? Now, beloved, listen to me. Many in Christendom today have never asked that question. Because we have such a truncated, trimmed-down gospel, I told you. People are telling everybody, this is, you don't have to do anything. Just believe. Just raise your hand. Just belong to a church. Just trust sacred tradition. Trust the pastor. Trust the pope. Trust the saints. Trust. Beloved, none of that has a wit to do with salvation. Amen? None of it. I, I got saved reading this book, trying to disprove this book. But that's how I got saved. I didn't have a, somebody coming up to me, witnessing to me like this. But through the Word of God, God himself stepped forth 
And I thank God every day of my Christianity. Amen. But see, beloved, he understood that it was going to be no easy cakewalk to get into the kingdom of God. It wouldn't be something that would be easy or effortless. And he understood, ladies and gentlemen, that what would happen is that if we did not follow Christ, Christ to the end, then he knew that most Jews would not be saved, most Gentiles would not be saved, and most religious folks who were trusting in everything but Jesus would not be saved. Would you say amen? You see, beloved, a lot of people do not want the demands and commands that Christ had put upon them. None of us do. I mean, this is the most disciplined uh, thing I've ever done in my life has been a Christian. And yet it's been the most liberating and freeing because we've become enslaved to Christ and free from all the things of this world. Amen? But a lot of people want a faith without faithfulness. Something that they do not... All, we're, we live in such entitlement today. That if somebody will just give me money or take care of me or do this or do that for me, and you know, but salvation has nothing to do with that either. That's a one-on-one -on -one relationship with the Lord our God. Why do we preach the Word of God right here? Because you can check it out in the Bible. You can find out whether I'm lying to you, and you can find out the truth of God's Word and get into the kingdom. Would you say amen? And I always tell you, check me out. Keep me honest. You've got something I don't have, I need it. And if you've done the footwork, then I'll check it out, and then let the Spirit of God confirm it in me, and I'll believe it, and I'll go, whew, I don't have to do that one. But you see, beloved, we know that no one will ever enter the kingdom, the Bible says, without the obedience of faith. James, the Lord's half-brother, says, Faith without works is dead, being alone. Now, last week we saw point number one, the Savior's exhortation, in verses 23 and 24. And I will not uh, direct you to the Scriptures again. You're going to have to get the DVDs on that. But Jesus didn't directly answer this man's question. He didn't turn around and say to the man, You really want to know? Instead, beloved, he, took the, he turned around and looked at all of the multitudes that were following him. He understood that this was such a serious and sober question that he needed to answer it. And so all the people's minds would get a hold of this, that they could understand it. And that's why he did that, beloved. And he's, he didn't turn around and say, just believe in me. He says, strive that you may enter in. Now, that must have shocked the Jew. Why? Because he thought he was entering in because he was a child of Abraham, physical child. That doesn't get you to heaven. You have to be a spiritual child of Abraham. Amen? But anyways, beloved, we saw that that word strive, agonizomai, means to strenuously and fervently fight and struggle and contend like a fighter does as he's training for a match. You know all the deprivations he has to go through. And then Jesus said this, that well, we need to labor for the meat that uh, labor not, excuse me, for the meat that perisheth, but for that meat that endures unto eternal life. And that word labor, ergazomai, means to engage and commit yourself to diligently seeking and toiling and doing hard work so you can enter into everlasting life, so you can obtain, maintain, and obtain this faith that constantly and continuously seeks after God, trusts God, follows after God. That's the kind of faith that saves. Come on and say amen out there. You see, beloved, Jesus said this in Matthew 24, 13. He says, he that endureth unto the end shall be saved. Now, you can't endure in anything unless you started it. It is not those who start well that win the race. It's those who finish well. Amen? A lot of people start. I've seen, in everything in my life, I've seen people start. Beloved, from from when I was in football, when I was in the Marine Corps, when I was in special, all of that. When Viet, a lot of people start a lot of things, martial arts, and they quit because it gets a little too tough for them. They didn't expect it was going to take this, and they don't get the blessing, by the way. It's one thing I don't, my kids, God bless, thank you, Father. If there's anything I taught my son and my daughter is don't you ever quit. You hang on and hang in until God either delivers you or he shows you he doesn't want you to do it. It's impossible to do, but don't quit. Anybody can quit, amen? And a lot of people do, unfortunately. And Jesus said that we're to follow him through the straight gate. And that word straight gate, stenos pule, means the divinely made narrow gate, the small and restricted gate that gives us access into the eternal kingdom of God. God says it's a little thing. Jesus even talked about the, uh, going through the eye of a needle. Okay, and a lot of people say that was a little door that was in the wall of Jerusalem. I don't believe that, but it, you get the picture anyways, beloved. 
And then in Matthew chapter 7, he told us to enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat, because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. And then Jesus went on and showed us the um, contrast between the straight and narrow gate and the broad and the wide gate. And I'm not going to revisit that because we've already talked about it. But also, ladies and gentlemen, God freely bestows his eternal life, his kingdom on us, who will persevere in the faith. Amen? Now, this is what I want to pick up right now because a lot of people, the Bible said, followed Jesus, but they ultimately walked away from him. It got too hard for them. Isn't that what happens in our life? Haven't we seen that happen here? We've, every church sees that. Every church sees that. And beloved, <clears throat> what does Jesus mean by the crucified life? Is that easy? Listen, crucifixion means you've got to die. Crucifixion means there's pain, there's suffering, there's sacrifice. Amen? I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. So we see that Paul wouldn't have said those things, ladies and gentlemen, if he did not understand. He said, I fear lest after I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. So I want to pick up right now on point number two. That was got a little background. I want to dive right in. Point number two, the serious realization. Look what he says in verse 25. When once the master of the house has risen up and has shut to the door, and you begin to stand outside. Now notice they're at the door. They think they're going into the kingdom. I mean, this is their bent. They, they want to do it. And to knock at the door saying, Lord, Lord, open unto us. And he shall answer and say unto you, I know you not whence ye are. Now, that word, master of the house, oko do, uh, despotes is the Greek word. It means the headmaster, the sovereign, authoritative ruler, and governor of the kingdom of God. Beloved, it means a divine one who alone regulates and controls the very access, admission, and entrance into the kingdom of God, both here and hereafter. Would you say amen? That Jesus alone is the singular portal and passageway into both aspects of the kingdom of God. Now, Revelation 3, 7 says this. Jesus said that he was the one that opens the door that no man can shut, and he shuts the door no man can open. Now, notice how impossible that is. When Christ opens a door, no one can close it in your life. When Christ shuts a door in your life, no one can open it in your life. He said that, by the way, to the church at Philadelphia, the faithful church of Philadelphia. Would you say amen? Acts 4.12 says this, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none under other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. Would you say Amen. Now, beloved, there are two aspects of the kingdom of God that I want you to briefly understand here this morning. And I'm just going to make a quick allusion to them. I want you to hear it, though. Number one, there is the spiritual kingdom of grace, or what we know as the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom that came down from heaven. Now, Jesus set this up on the earth at the first advent. We enter into the spiritual kingdom of heaven here on earth through the new birth. In John chapter 3, verses 3 through 7, I won't quote it for you, but Jesus said this, Except the man is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Jesus said, Except the man is born of water, that's baptism, and the Holy Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Now that's pretty clear, isn't it? Now a lot of people try to fudge it up, but it's pretty clear. Now the problem is not with what Jesus said, the problem is what we want Jesus to say. It's our prejudices, our biases, our preconceived notions, isn't it? Now, beloved, my question to you this morning, so have you truly been born again? Have you truly been born of water and of the Spirit? Have you truly experienced the new birth? Have you truly, ladies and gentlemen, <coughs> excuse me, entered in <coughs> to that kingdom of God yet? Have you done it? I pray that you have. In Mark chapter 16, verse 16, Jesus said this. Now listen to me. He says, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Now what are you saying, Pastor? I'm saying this. That's the salvation equation he gave us. If we ever wanted to enter into the spiritual kingdom of God, if we ever want to see it, 
if you ever want to be in it, beloved, that is the salvation equation. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Now, he didn't say, he that is first baptized as an infant, then believed, shall be saved. He didn't say that. He didn't say, beloved, he that believes shall be saved, then he should go and get baptized. He didn't say that. He didn't say, he that believes but doesn't get baptized shall be saved. He didn't say that. He said, he that believeth, and in addition to that, that's a coordinating conjunction that connects two words of equal worth and importance, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Now listen to me, beloved, because it's simple enough. He said, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. You say, well, uh, well, are you going to argue with Jesus? Do you want to argue with him? Do you want to stand before him? Jesus, did you lie to me? Now, if Jesus said this to you, he that believeth and is baptized shall re- receive a million bucks, every one of you would be lined up waiting for me at the baptismal appear. You wouldn't have one misunderstanding of what he said. But because it contradicts your theology, you don't want to believe it. But see, that's what happened when these people were following Jesus. What he was saying was the truth of the Word of God, and they looked at him as a renegade preacher. They didn't want to believe what he had to say, what the true interpretation of the scriptures were, just like many today, amen? So we do do well not to argue with God. So if you ever want to see or enter into the spiritual kingdom of God, then you must be born again. Would you say amen? Number two, the sovereign kingdom of God, or the, the sovereign kingdom of God and of glory. This is the eternal kingdom of God, that eternal kingdom of glory that Christ will set up at the second advent when he comes back, at the day of judgment, ladies and gentlemen. Now listen to me. This is entered through a life of faith and faithfulness to God. This is entered (coughs) through a life of submission and surrender to God, a life of dedication and devotion to God. This is entered through a life of total commitment and consecration to God. What are you saying, Pastor? In other words, we must constantly and continuously let Jesus Christ himself now live his life out in us, with us, through us, so we can persevere in the faith and endure uh, unto the end in either our life or the end of the age. Would you say amen? It's he that works in you that's doing this work. But I must allow him to like I allow him to when I got saved. Amen? I never lost my free will. You listen to me. In Philippians 1, 6, it says this. It says, being confident of this very thing, that he that hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. He that begun a good work in you, past salvation and sanctification, will perform it, present salvation and sanctification, until the day of Jesus Christ, perfect salvation and sanctification. Would you say amen out there? So, beloved, this requires us to constantly and continuously cooperate with the Spirit and grace of God. That's what faith does. This requires us to utilize the supernatural power of of God's means of grace, like the Bible, like prayer, like coming to church, like the sacraments. These are means of grace that God has given to us. This requires us to reckon ourselves dead, indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. This requires us to constantly and continuously yield ourselves to the power and the promptings of the Holy Spirit and the living Christ inside of us, beloved, to let Him as our Lord and our King rule and reign in our life. Amen? That's what faith does. Faith is just not some nebulous belief that you just chuck up in the air. That's not what the Bible teaches at all. And, beloved, this requires us to let God God himself inwardly cause and compel us to live a holy, righteous, and godly life like Jesus did that's fit for the kingdom of heaven. And oh, by the way, this requires us also to obey his commandments so we can live in harmony with and in conformity to the God's word, beloved, throughout our life. And that we can be faithful followers and disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ who are striving, pressing on that upward way. New heights I'm gaining every day. Still praying as I'm onward bound. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. Amen. I'm pressing on, I'm pressing on, I'm pressing on. I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus, Paul said. Would you say amen? He didn't say I back. He didn't say I just put my feet up. He didn't say any of that, beloved. Paul understood. And nothing meant more to him, by the way, and it shouldn't to us either. 
to obtain that full and final salvation. Would you say amen? And beloved, this is what Paul meant when he said this in Philippians 12 and 13. He said, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God that worketh in you both the will and the do of his good pleasure. Don't work for your salvation. Work out that salvation that God has worked in. For it is God that worketh in you. That is, it is God motivating you. God developing things in you. Both to will. He's divinely enabling, empowering you to do his good pleasure. See, but I must allow that. I must cooperate with it. I must utilize that. That, my friends, is what faith does. Would you say amen? So this is how God saves us. Now, ladies and gentlemen, hear me now. I don't want you to miss this. This takes vigilance on our part. This takes diligence and persistence on our part. This takes pursuit and earnestness and effort on our part. This takes striving and labor on our part. I don't mean meriting anything. I mean laboring in the faith. Would you say amen? Why, Pastor? Because this is the only kind of faith that Jesus taught and expects that will save us and make us fit to enter into the eternal kingdom of God. You see, folks, through faith we must cooperate with God, for He neither saves us nor keeps anyone saved against their will. Are you listening to me? In 1 Peter 1.5, the Bible says this, We are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. Now let me break that down for you. We are kept by the power of God, divine sovereignty. Through faith, human responsibility. Unto salvation. Hey, did you hear that? Unto salvation. Is he talking to unsaved people or people who are already saved? See, we're going to our full and final salvation. That's what he's talking about there, isn't it? He isn't talking about initial salvation. For we, who's the we? We, Peter, the apostle who wrote this, we who are the believers that are reading it. We are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. Now why, Pastor? Why are you saying this? Because we must be circumspect. Beloved, don't shelve your brains. We must be diligent because we can still sin. We can still backslide, beloved, or apostatize. Listen to me, we can still fall from grace and ultimately be lost if we drop out of the race because our faith did not hang in in faithfulness. Would you say amen? That's why Peter said this in 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 10 and 11. He exhorts us. Now listen to what he says. He says, give all diligence to make your calling and your election sure. For if you do these things, what? Note the condition. For if you do these things, you shall never fall, that is, fall away from God. For so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now that's pretty clear, isn't it? But what if we don't give all diligence uh, uh, like this in our faith? But what if we don't make our calling and election sure or slash secure? But what if we don't do these things? Will we still enter in to the everlasting kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ? Well, beloved, Jesus said no. Paul said no. Peter says no. He says, if I endure, if I'm diligent, if I add to my faith. That's what the Bible says in 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 1 through 9. Add to your faith temperance and knowledge. And say, I must be adding. If I can add it, it means I don't have a full faith yet. Amen? So adding, 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 adding. So I'm stronger, stronger, stronger. Growing in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Not just an animated suspension in my life, just kind of treading water. You're not growing, you're backsliding. The Bible says we're to grow in grace, not groan in disgrace. And a lot of people will groan in disgrace. So that's why Jesus said in verse 24 that many will seek to someday enter in, but shall not be able to, no matter how much they profess to follow him. So, beloved, what I'm saying to you is, don't ever commit the sin of presumption, thinking that because you got saved, well, you know what, I professed Jesus once in my life, that no matter how you live right now, you're going to enter in. That is not true. That is an absolute uh, lie comes right out of the of hell, and it even smells like smoke. That's what he told Adam and Eve. Was Adam in a state of grace? Yes, he was, ladies and gentlemen. But Satan says to Eve, you won't die, you'll be as God. Did she die when she sinned? Plunged the whole human race into sin and ruin. 
Jesus said this in Revelation 2.10. He said, Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. But hear me now. Jesus said this in James 1.12. Blessed is the man that endureth temptation, for when he is tried, then shall he receive the crown of life, which God hath promised to them that love him. Love him? Well, in John 14, 15, Jesus said, If you love me, if you do, what should I do? Keep my commandments. Now, did he say that or not? Or am I just making it up? You see, beloved, God doesn't just hand out the crown of eternal life and entrance into his eternal kingdom to anyone who claims to be a believer and a disciple of Christ. Only to those whose faith strives to be faithful and proves itself to be real and genuine when it is tested in the crucible of the fiery furnace of adversity and affliction in your life. Would you say amen? God is going to say, away with you, all you impenitent rebels. Away with you, all of you carnal and sinful people. Away with you, worldly people. Away with you people who are stubborn and complacent. Away with you people who are unfaithful. Away with you people who are backsliders. You won't repent. You know what I told you to do, yet you wouldn't do it. Your faith would not even push you forward. God will say, away with you. Get away from me. You'll not inherit my eternal kingdom. You'll not inherit my eternal life. You'll not inherit my eternal city, the new Jerusalem. How dare you even assume or presume to even think that you're now worthy enough to grace the doors and enter into the sacred gates of my eternal city and my kingdom. How dare you do that? Why? Because God says in my eternal kingdom, the people here have continually strived and struggled in the faith to get into heaven. Have you? See, God says, in my eternal kingdom, the people here have continually labored hard and toiled to enter into my eternal kingdom. Have you? God says, my, all the people that are up here with me, you see, they have strived and struggled and they've been persecuted and persevered in the faith to enter into my eternal kingdom. Have you? That's who I have up here around me right now. You see, the, the, all of these have got bloodied bodies and, and bloodied testimonies. That's the kind of people I got around me up here in heaven. In, why? In my eternal kingdom, people up here have been chained and imprisoned, and they've been butchered, and they've been slain, and they've been martyred for the Lord. They tried this. Why? So they could enter into my kingdom. Have you done that? That's the kind of faith that he's talking about here, isn't he? People think that you're going to have those noteworthy people up there, and then you're going to have people that just came to Christ, lived, went back into the world, did what they wanted to do, whatever, and they're going to just grace the doors of God's heaven. Is that what Jesus taught? I don't think so. And I could defend it, and I've defended it multiple times over the years. And beloved, all I can tell you, it's the fool's hope if you embrace the other position. You listen to me. God is saying something like, so why should I now let you into my eternal kingdom when you've not heeded my word to strive in the faith and fight in the spiritual battle to get in like them? Tell me why you think you're even worthy enough to stand with these honorable saints who have ventured their lives, who have suffered and sacrificed their lives for me. Tell me why you think you're able to get in when they've done this and you haven't done it. You see, beloved, Jesus is saying how fair and just and equitable would it be for the, uh, all of these praiseworthy saints who have done this uh, for me, to now let you uncommitted people into my eternal kingdom of heaven, you who have been at ease in Zion. How worthy would that be? Beloved, how would you like it if you went to work and you were there from the, the beginning of the, the um, founding of this company, you did all of the work there, you did everything, you obeyed every law, whatever, and then some guy comes in off the street and says, yeah, I want to get hired, and all of a sudden he takes your position. How would you feel? Do you think that would be fair? You think that would be equitable, especially when you look at the, the book and you look at the rules and he, don't, he hasn't obeyed any of them. He hasn't lived up to any of them. And yet Christians are thinking because they've been taught a truncated gospel because I raised my hand, because I came forward, because I got baptized, I'm saved. All right. Beloved, you need a faith that will persevere. Would you say amen? Not just persevere, uh, I don't mean just hangs in there. I mean just persevering in holiness and godliness and righteousness in your life and faithfulness in your life. That's the kind of faith that Jesus here is talking about. He's saying why I'd be betraying those people that did this. 
Why, I'd be breaking my own word. I'd be undermining my own eternal kingdom if I let you in. You see, folks, I can just see Jesus saying, didn't I repeatedly warn you that no one gets into my heaven without an active, living, dynamic faith? Didn't I repeatedly warn you that no one gets into my heaven without obeying my commandments and having a working faith that constantly and continuously strives and puts forth enter, faith to enter in? Didn't I repeatedly warn you that no one gets into my heaven who has moral and spiritual apathy and indifference toward the things of God? Didn't I repeatedly warn you that no one gets into my heaven with a cold, complacent, lethargic, lukewarm heart, faith in life that puts self before uh, and flesh before me? Didn't I repeatedly warn you that no one gets into my heaven just by sitting back and trying to easily and effortlessly drift and coast along in the faith into the kingdom of God? Didn't I say not, that's not how you're going to get into the kingdom? How many times do I have to repeat it? Can't you hear God saying that? What more could I say? I gave it to you in my Bible. I gave it to you with my preachers. I gave it to you with my prophets. I gave it to you with my apostles. What more, what more, what more do I have to do before it sinks in to your thick head? God is saying, so what do you expect me to do now? Break the rules? So what do you expect me to do now? Violate my own word? So what do you expect me to do now? Just let you in anyway? I can't do it. Lest I contradict my own intrinsic nature and attributes and commandments, you should have seriously heeded my word. Oh, beloved, you know the Revelation twenty two fourteen. 14, we saw it this morning. Blessed are those that do his commandments, that they may have a right into the, uh, to the tree of life and enter in through the gates into the city. Not blessed are those who believe my commandments, not blessed are those who heard my commandments. Blessed are those, Jesus, last book of the Bible. Before it closed the canon of Scripture. Blessed are those who do my commandments. Am I right? Now, you probably never heard it put like that before, but you need to. Because you need to stop waffling. Or when I say you, I'm talking about everybody that's watching me on TV, everything. People are just straddling the fence all the time. Just got enough world to enjoy it, enough Christ to enjoy it, and just straddling the fence. God says, listen, you're going to get hurt that way. You're either with me or against me. No man can serve two masters. You either love the one and hate the other, or else you despise the one, and you'll follow the other. Amen? So we need to understand that, ladies and gentlemen. Now look at verse 25a. The Bible says, when once the master of the house is risen up, Egairo, risen up, it implies that Jesus is now seated on his heavenly throne at the Father's right hand. See, he's got to rise up because he's been set down. But someday he'll rise up from being seated to come back, and he'll now judge all the inhabitants of the earth. And notice the words, he says, shut to the door. That's the Greek word thura. And it denotes that there is a specific time limit to salvation throughout this age and also in a person's life. Don't ever think that God has said to you, he's left it up to you, you can put it off, put it off, put it off, and then when you get to be 49 years old, after you've sowed your wild oats, then I'll accept Jesus. God has drawn a line in the sand. There's a time limit. 2 Corinthians 6, 2 says, Behold, today is the accepted day. Behold, today is the day of salvation. Not tomorrow. Not next year. Listen to me, kids. Listen to me, mom and dad. Listen to me, you folks who are straddling the fence. Today, today, today is the day of salvation. Oh, beloved. You could have a stroke right now, a heart attack right now. Where would you be if you stood before God? Now, I hope you can say I'd be with God. But I hope you can say that based on what Jesus thought and not what you feel. Amen? The Bible says to examine ourselves to see whether or not we are in the faith. 2 Corinthians chapter 13. So, beloved, listen to me. Jesus tells us that the door of salvation... The door of the kingdom of God won't always be opened. See, he's going to rise up and he's going to shut the door. And the Bible says that someday when he does this, beloved, it will slam shut. And then the golden door of his probation and grace and salvation will forever slam shut 
on the hinges of His mercy and no one else will ever be able to be saved or enter into the kingdom of God. You must settle the issue now in your life. I'm going to follow you, Lord. I don't care about anything else. I will follow you. That's what I need to do. That's what I will do. I know that you're watching my life, everything that I do, and how you're born with me and born with me, and I've spurned your mercy. I've trampled the blood of Christ on the floor. You can't do it. I repent, oh God. Help me, oh God. Because of believing the lies that somebody's saying you can live as filthy as a barnyard dog and still grace the doors of God's heaven. And that is what's being preached today, and you know that. Even those who say once saved, always saved, beloved, have to acquiesce to that fact. They say, well, I know that, you know, uh, you know, David was a backslider, but you know, he would have never lost his salvation. Well, let me see if I've got this straight. The Ten Commandments says, thou shalt not commit adultery. Did he do it? Those who commit adultery should be stoned to death. That's what the Bible said in the Old Testament. They say, uh, thou shalt have no other gods before me. Well, thank the Lord, David didn't have that. But the Bible says, thou shalt not kill or commit premeditated murder. Did he do that? A premeditated murder? There was no grace. There was no hope. He couldn't run to the city of refuge. He was to be what? Stoned to death. It was a capital offense. Now you tell me, was David saved when he was living in those sins? According to the word of God, not what you think of your doctrine. David, beloved, the reason he was so faithful is because he never went into idolatry. He always trusted the word of God. And what did he do? He fell on his face and he said, Lord, I'm going to get it right. Take not thy spirit from me. Restore it to me. A clean heart, O oh Lord. Do a right spirit within me. So David understood what was going on. Too bad a lot of Christians today don't understand what's going on. You see, beloved, someday Jesus will rise up. He'll rise up from being Savior and he will come back as the almighty judge of heaven and earth. Right now he's the Savior. But someday he's coming back as what? He's coming back at the judge. Oh, beloved, you keep your account shot. Make sure you're right with God minute by minute, day by day, month by month, year by year. He's number one in your life. He's the priority of your life. You hear me now? Because he comes back, then no one else will be able to believe. No one else will be able to repent or be saved or enter the kingdom of God. It will be done, ladies and gentlemen. Now it will be too little, too late. When Christ suddenly and unexpectedly returns, then the moral and spiritual state he finds you in will now be yours and it will be irrevocably sealed in your life forever. And beloved, this is how you will enter eternity. You'll either be saved or you'll be lost. There'll be no second chances. Now there'll be no time left for you to get right with God. Now listen to what Jesus said in Revelation 12, chapter 22, verses 11 and 12. This is the very last chapter of the Bible. This is his message to the seven churches. Jesus said this. He says, he that is unjust, let him be unjust still. He that is filthy, let him be filthy still. He that is righteous, let him be righteous still. He that is holy, let him be holy still. He says, Behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me to give unto every man according to his work shall be. Now, those are pretty clear to me. I, I, I don't even have to get my thesaurus out to look up any words. I understand what he's saying. Do you? I think you do, ladies and gentlemen. But you, the point I'm getting at Jesus is saying this, that the state I find you in is a state you're going to enter eternity. If Christ would come right now, flat, you'd be flash frozen. You're walking with God, hallelujah. You're in the kingdom, living forever. But what if you're teetering? What if you're just fooling around? What if you're living in sin? What if you're impenitent? What if you're backslidden? He that is filthy, let him be filthy still. He that is unholy, let him be unholy still. Because no man without holiness... We'll ever see the Lord. You see, beloved, what I'm saying to you is this, and I don't have time to develop this, but this parallels Matthew chapter 25, verses 1 through 13. This is the parable of the ten virgins. They all went out to see the bridegroom, the Lord. Five, went, they went out with lamps. All of them had lamps. All of them had oil burning, the Holy Spirit. But five slept in preparation. Five slept that were unprepared. They slept and they slumber. 
when they announced that the bridegroom was coming, those who uh, were prepared, they got up and they trimmed their lamps because they had extra oil, extra Holy Spirit, extra grace, extra mercy in their life. But those who were unprepared said, wait a minute, our lamps are going out. That's the Greek term, you know what's in your mind. Lamps are gone out or going out. Can't go out or gone out unless they've been lit. Right? Our lamps are going out. And they said, listen, uh, w- will you help us here? Can we, can we borrow some from you? No, no. You, we only got enough for ourselves. You go and get some. When they went to get some, the, the bride came or the groom came and did what? Shut the door. And they come back, let us in. Let us in. We want to come in. A lot of people are sleeping right now in Zion. A lot of people are slumbering right now in Zion. They've not really understood or internalized the Word of God so they can externalize that Word, that blessed Word, in their life. Would you say amen? Oh, beloved, note these two things quickly. Number one, the spiritual exclusion. Look what he says in verse 25. He says, When once the master of the house has risen up and has shut to the door, and you begin to stand without and to knock at the door, saying, Lord, Lord, open unto us, and we shall answer and say unto you, I know you not whence ye are. Notice Jesus here is not only the master of the house, ladies and gentlemen, he's the very door, he's the very entrance, he's the passageway into the sheepfold in the kingdom of heaven through which all the sheep can find salvation and now come and go as they please under the lordship and care and guidance of this great shepherd. Amen? But here we see non-strivers, non-seekers being excluded and barred from the kingdom of God. And they even call Jesus Lord, Lord, yet he still slams the door shut in their face and even denies that he ever knew them. Now that's incredible to me. I remember reading that as a new Christian. I went, boy, did that anything sober me up? That was one certain truth that woke me up. Why, beloved? I'll tell you why. Because they were but nominal Christians. Why, beloved? Because they were but lukewarm believers. And what did Jesus say to the church of Laodicea? If you're lukewarm, I'll do what? Vomit you. I'll spew you out of my mouth. Well, bold, uh, you've got to be in the mouth where you're spewed out. Is he talking to unsaved there or is he talking to the church? I'm just so sick of hearing people talk about this, beloved, they don't even know where they're coming from. Aren't you? Aren't you? You see, beloved, these people here are non-strivers. They're impenitent backsliders. These people here are the unfaithful, the uncommitted. How far would your marriage go if you acted toward your spouse like you do toward Jesus? How far would your career go? You answer that in your life. You see, beloved, they're uncommitted professors who are either really never saved in the first place, or they're no longer saved because of their lackadaisical and pitiful moral and spiritual state that they're now in. So they cry out, Lord, Lord, that Greek word, beloved, look it up. It's kurios, kurios, my sovereign master, my sovereign master. You don't say, well, I just think you're some guy that's going to save me. They're talking like they have an intimate relationship with this person or had one. You see, beloved, so they cry, Lord, Lord, begging, pleading now to come in. So that's a spiritual exclusion. Number two, the seeker's expectation. Look what he says in verse 25c and 26. He's saying, Lord, Lord, open unto us, and he shall answer and say unto them, unto you, I know you not whence you are. Then she would begin to say, We have eaten and drunk in thy presence, and thou hast taught in our streets. Let me stop you right there. I want you to notice, ladies and gentlemen, that they stand outside the door and they knock. That Greek word, kruo, means they knock in a great panic, in great fear. They knock in great terror. They vehemently and fervently knock and thump and pound on the door. Why? For Christ to let them into his house. Why? For Christ to let them in to his city, to his kingdom, into eternal life, to let them into his heaven. They're thumping and they're pounding and they're knocking. Oh, I want to come in. I want to come in. I want to come in. Please, no. I believe it now. I believe it now. Can't you just see it? I know I wasn't faithful in my life. I know you told me I should be. But you know what? I thought I was as faithful as I needed to be and that's it. No, that's not it, is it? You see, ladies and gentlemen, I can just hear them cry. Say what, Lord? 
you don't know us? Why, we have eaten and, uh, and drunk in thy presence. Why, we have feasted with you in your house and in your church. We've come to church and we've sang. We've heard about you. We've been involved in youth group. We've been involved in the choir. Why, Lord, you know, we have listened to you as you taught in our streets. Why, we have followed thee and believed in thee. We have prayed and praised thee and sang hymns that exalt and honor your name. Why, we have prophesied in thy name. Why, we have cast out demons in thy name. Why, we have done many wonderful works in thy name. And now you say, Lord, you won't let us in. How can this be? How can it be, O Lord? Oh, that's a good question now, isn't it? How can it be? You see, ladies and gentlemen, I can just see them saying, now you're saying you never knew us, Lord? Lord, let me see if I got it right. Now you're saying we're but strangers to you, Lord? Even though we've been in your house, we've been in your church, we've taken communion, we've done all of this? Isn't that what he's saying here? And now you say, Lord, we can't come into your kingdom? How can this be, Lord? Lord, we beg you, we plead you, we entreat you, O God, to open the door and please let us into thy kingdom. You see, beloved, listen to me. Now these outsiders want to get serious with God, but it's too late in their life. They straddled the fence through their Christian walk, didn't they? I'm too tired. Oh, you know what? I don't want to get up and go to church. I don't want to do this. I got plenty of time. I've always come out of my problems pretty good. Yeah, you got to thank God for the mercy. Remember I told you Thumas and Orge, uh, when God pours out his wrath, God judges you. Look at your life. Has God judged you? Trying to get your attention? Has he put some mercy on there for you? Of course he has. But not when the Orge comes. Then he'll be unmerciful. You see, beloved, a lot of people sacrifice. You've heard me say it so many times the eternal on the altar of the temporal. I want to be like Joel Osteen. I want I have all of the blessings of this world and I want heaven to boot. John says, love not the world. Neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life is not of the Father, but of the world. And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof. But he that doeth, he that doeth, he that doeth the will of the Father shall abide forever. Amen? Isn't that what he says? If any man's a friend of the world, he's enmity with God. I told you, enmity is more than being an enemy. When you're an enmity someone, beloved, you still don't persecute them, you pluck their nails out first. You squeeze them. You make them hurt. You torment them. You taunt them. God says, you're a friend of the world, and it's the exclusion of me. That's what happens. Now, now beloved, that's James chapter 4, verse 4. Is James writing to Christians there? I've taught you the book. All throughout, he says, my brethren, my brethren, my brethren, my brethren, my brethren. He says it 12 times. He's not talking to unsaved, is he? He's talking to brethren. So what am I saying to you, beloved? I'm saying love not the world. Lastly, let me give you my third point. I got a few minutes. The scathing condemnation. The scathing condemnation. Look what he says in verses 27 and 28. But he shall say, I tell you, I know you not when ye are. Depart from me, all ye workers of iniquity. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth when you shall see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God, and you yourselves thrust out. Now, I wonder how many unsaved people really think about Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and the prophets. How many do you think? You see, beloved, Christ replies to their response to come in here. But I want you to see, he replies with cutting and biting and shocking words. No two things here. Number one, their denunciation in verse 27. He calls them the workers of of iniquity. That is, those who know to do right, he that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin, but they won't do it. I know what pastor said. Beloved, you don't have to answer to me. If it was up to me, you get in anyway. I'm easy, but I'm not perfect. And I'm not holy. Perfectly holy, or perfectly righteous, or perfectly godly, like God is. And that's what it's going to take, isn't it? And I'm either going to hold on to Christ's coattails, he's going to see me in Christ, or I'm not going to. 
You say, ladies and gentlemen, what I say to you is this here. He's saying you workers of iniquity, you who constantly violate, you who constantly disobey my commandments, my law, and live such an unholy, unrighteous, ungodly, unfaithful, uncommitted life. That's what a worker of iniquity is. No commitment whatsoever. None. You say, Pastor, why are you hammering that home? Because it needs to be. I want it on TV. I want it on DVD. I want those once saved, always saved people to get out of their chair and try to prove me wrong. There's not a text you could show me within the context what they're saying. They take selective text and try to do it. You know, last week, because we're getting ready to change our TV ministry, getting new pictures and new songs, and we're going to have Dave and Denise uh, on there. So I turned it on just to see if I get some ideas. We were on Sunday morning, right? I hate, I, I, you know, you can't stand yourself. But you know what, beloved? You know what I was preaching about? It's about seven months behind, apostasy. And, and it's so important that we understand that. For some reason, Satan has blinded the church. They, he's lulled the church to sleep because they're thinking that Christianity is really an exercise in intellectualism. If I can just memorize enough doctrine, then I'll get into the kingdom. It has nothing to do with your relationship, really. How much do you love the Lord? How much gratitude do you have to the Lord? What kind of a relationship do you have with the Lord? Is it just one on an intellectual level where you've got your doctrinal ducks all lined up? Imagine marrying your spouse like that. Well, you know, you come from good stock, and I love your genealogy, and um, that's my wife. She was blue blood. They all came from England, you know. She old pip pip and all that rock, you know, governor. They came over on the Mayflower. Well, uh, us Portuguese came over in the Nina the Pinta de Santa Maria, right? <laughs> So we had three boats, right? <laughs> you see, beloved, what does he do? He starts disavowing and denying them, even knowing them. You know, you ever say to someone, get away from me, I don't even, I don't even know you. Now, of course, Christ knows everybody because he's omniscient. But he's going to say, I, I, I don't know, who are you? You're Katie? No. <laughs> Katie? Katie, Katie, remember that song? You can see what he's saying, beloved. And then they're going to hear him say those dreadful words. Depart from me. Ephesteme. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. That is, get far away from me and leave me alone, both now and forevermore. Get away. Stop trampling my blood underfoot. Stop using the grace of God in vain. Stop frustrating the grace of God in vain. Stop imposing on my mercy. Don't do it to me anymore. That's their denunciation. Let me close with this. Look at their excruciation in verse 28a. He says, and there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now, beloved, the word weeping, klothmas, means to wail, to scream. It means to cry hard and loudly and uncontrollably. Have you ever really cried? I remember when my dad passed away, and it's a long story, but I won't get into it. But I, was, I kept myself strong for the funeral, did the funeral. Everybody came and talked to me. I was fine. And then after I buried my dad, after trying to be strong for everybody, I walked off of myself, and I wept like a baby. My father was so full of uh, vigor, vim. I, I mean, you had to know. I mean, you just don't think people like that die, but everybody does, right? But he was so full of life. I mean, I always, I, no one ever had me laughing more than my old man. I got to say that to you. He would, uh, I'll, I'll never forget, I first came back from Vietnam, and my mother was watching the Merv Griffin show. And so the son was coming in on the TV, and Merv Griffin was interviewing a man, and he's saying, Merv said to him, So you speak foreign languages? He says, Si, sí, I speak uh, Espanol. He says, you speak Spanish? He says, yes. And my father says, I speak Spanish. And my mother says, Joe, I know you speak Portuguese, and I know you speak Hebrew, and I know you speak, she went on, you don't speak Spanish. So he looks at me and he says, hey, reposito, bota la catino por bocho. In Portuguese, hey, reposing, okay, a young man, but he, my father put it with like a Spanish. 
Hey, Reposito, put the Lacatino for a bar. Put the shades down. <laughs> I mean, I was on the floor. I, I couldn't help it, right? I was at a football game one time also. My father loved football. When I used to play football, imagine, I, I'm, I'm captain of the defensive team. It isn't the coach that comes out when I miss a block or a, my father. He comes running down the field. Hey, didn't I tell you to watch the end? And the coach saying, Mr. Patello, get back. I'm not getting back. He come over and give me a slap upside the helmet. Dad, get out of here. I told you to watch the end. He's going he's gonna to try to come up the middle of the next play. You watch him now. So there was a girl there who was a good friend of mine who had polio when she was young. You folks don't know much about polio now, but it was a crippler then. And she had crutches. So my father said to her, what the heck happened to you? And I almost crawled under the bench. <laughs> now, my father had no vergunia. Uh, that means no shame here. He goes to her. She says, I'm sorry, Miss Patel, but I had polio. You what? I had polio. You have it now? Yeah. Well, how you feel? Well, I hope you're feeling better. Well, you look pretty good. <laughs> I walked away like this. But when my father wept, died, I wept uncontrolled. I was out by myself in the woods, and I wept, and I wept never to see him again until I get the glory, never to talk to him again, never to laugh with him again. Beloved, it cut me right to the quick, and I won't belabor the point, only to say that's what it means here when it talks about weeping like that, crying, wailing, ah, ha, ha, ha. Can't you just see them? That's what it's going to be like on the day of judgment when people think you are going to get in and they don't get in. And they're begging and they're pleading and they're pounding and they're thumping. Oh God, oh God, please, please, I beg you now. Listen, I profess faith in you. And then he says not only weeping, but notice he says gnashing of teeth. Brugmas. It means to grit and grind your teeth tightly, to clench them together. I don't know if you've ever had anything that hurt you like that. And you literally, uh. you see, beloved, it's used here to denote the extreme pain and anguish and utter despair and hopelessness of men now realizing they're consigned to eternal torment and punishment in the burning, boiling, bubbling flames of the lake of fire forever. Ah, ah. Didn't Jesus say, where the fire is unquenchable, where the torment is unquenchable. Didn't Jesus teach that in Mark 9? Now it's pretty clear. Now we have a tendency to not preach those things. But we don't want to upset the apricot. See, we want to get multitudes in here, and we don't want to teach them the whole counsel of God because it might blow them out the door. Well, listen, beloved, God's going to lead in here who he wants to come here. And we're just going to preach as God gives it to us. Amen? You see, beloved, then it says this. Notice he says in verse 28, the last part, and you yourselves thrust out. Ekbalo exo. That's the Greek word. It means to forcibly, beloved, to uh, forcibly be expelled, cast out, driven out from the presence of the Lord forever. I'm saying when God slams the door, it will be final. When God slams the door, it will be frightful. When God slams the door, it will be forever the time to get right. When God slams the door, beloved, like this, there'll be no more hope. There'll be no more salvation. There'll be no more eternal life. There'll be no more entrance into the kingdom of God, no matter how much you cry, no matter how much you beg, no matter how much you knock, no matter how much you're pounding, no matter how much you jump up and down, no matter how much you say you believe, you must do the will of God. And if your faith doesn't lead you to do the will of God, you don't have a good, saving, genuine, active, living faith. You see, beloved, to come so close at eternity with Christ in heaven and yet be so very far away, that's unbelievable to me. Why? Because they did not take their faith and their salvation, listen to me, seriously. A lot of people don't. Well, I know I accepted Jesus and I got baptized, whatever, so I'm going to the kingdom. Of heaven. Not serious. Not serious at all. They think it's a game. They're going to coast then. They're going to drift then. And you know what Paul said to the church at Ephesus? I said, did he said to where? 
the church at Ephesus. In Ephesians chapter 5, verse 4, 14, Paul said this, Awake thou that sleepest, arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. Now, who is he talking to? Is he talking to the heathen, or is he talking to the church? We know the church at Ephesus. Just read Revelation <laughs> chapter 2. It's the first ch uh, church mentioned. They left their first love. And Paul's trying to stir them up. Awake, awake thou that sleepest. Arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee life. Hey, you know what Jesus said? Hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. He said it seven times in Revelation. Hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. I pray that you hear it. I pray that you're walking with the Lord. I pray that you love God. You're not perfect. You don't have a perfect faith, but you have a perfect proclivity and bent in your heart that wants to follow the Lord. Amen? That's the faith that saves. You see, beloved, Christ extends an invitation to everyone. And he says in Matthew chapter 28, uh, ch chapter 11, verses 28 through 30, he says, Come unto me, all ye that labor and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly of heart, and you shall find rest of your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Now, why did I quote that to you? Because the word come here, beloved, is the Greek word dute. It's an adverb, but it's a present ter tense adverb. This is what he's saying. Come to me. And keep coming to me. And I'll give you rest and more rest and more rest. Come unto me until we finally meet in the eternal kingdom of God. That's what Jesus beckons all those who claim to have faith in him to do. Because the day's coming when God will slam the door. This is the age of probation right now, isn't it? This is it. No other chance. You don't even guarantee the next heart's going to be. Brother Derek called last night, and he said about his neighbor who was a head-on collision and passed away. Do you think when she left the house with that dog, that she thought that was going to happen to her? I don't. What I'm saying to you is this here. Don't put your trust in this pastor, this church, any other preacher, you put your trust in what you see in the Word of God and rightly divide the Word of Truth. The word rightly divide is the Greek word orthodonte. What is it? What English word do you hear? Orthodontist. What does an orthodontist do? He straightens out your teeth. God says rightly divide the Word of Truth. Straighten it out in your life. It doesn't matter what denomination you're from. That's, God doesn't say, well, listen, you're Catholic, you're not coming in. You're Protestant, you can't, well, you're Baptist, nah, get away from me. No. God doesn't say that. God says, you persevered, you love me so much, you persevered, come on in. Oh, I saw how you stood up there and testified and preached the word and how you uh, try to live for me. I saw your life being persecuted from your co-workers, blah, 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 whatever it may be, come on in. you got real faith. When God shuts the door, slams it tight. Let me in, let me in, let me in. Get away from me. When God shuts the door, let's go to the throne of grace.